the marriage of Julia, the only daughter of Caesar Augustus, to her stepbrother, Tiberius Claudius Nero, was not a happy marriage. If, indeed, any of Julia's marriages were happy. For Rome's nobility, marriage was a time-tested tool for creating political alliances deemed beneficial to the families of both bride and groom. Such marriage contracts were negotiated and prearranged between the part of familiars of their families, without considering the feelings of those who were forced to marry. But for Julia, marriage of the elite took on a new dimension. There was not a single family anywhere in Rome that could contribute to the dignity and status of Julia's father. As head of Rome's legions, with his patrician Claudian wife at his side, Augustus more than dominated Rome's social hierarchy. And so, Julia became a trophy wife, awarded by her father to whomever scored the highest in the contest for Caesar's personal favor. Marcus Claudius Marcellus was the first man to win the prize. Marcellus was the only son of Caesar Augustus's sister, Octavia Thurina, whose household had taken on a decidedly Antonian look. By marrying Julia to her cousin, Marcellus, Augustus might give the impression of unity with the sympathizers of Marcus Antonius. But the legions were not impressed, and grumbled at the idea of some patrician youngster displacing their beloved commander, Marcus Vipsanius Agrippa, the very man who had led Caesar Augustus to his many military victories. Then, Marcellus died. In order to please the legions, Caesar Augustus next awarded Julia to a man who was the same age as her father. Marcus Agrippa became the next man to accept the prize. After Julia gave Agrippa two sons, which her father immediately stole through adoption, Julia grabbed her daughter Julilla and followed Marcus Agrippa to the east as he took up his governorship. Julia gave birth to a second daughter in Athens, then returned home with her husband, who was needed for Caesar Augustus's invasion of Germania. However, after returning home, Agrippa's health began to fail, and before long, a pregnant Julia was widowed once again. As a widow of nobility, who had given birth to five children for her late husband, Julia should have been sui iuris, finally free of any legal obligation to marry and produce offspring under the intrusive marriage laws her father had imposed on Rome. But the details of his own law did not apply to Caesar's daughter. Once again, ordained by her political usefulness, Julia was forced on another man. And so, even before her mourning period had ended, Julia found herself married to her stepbrother, Tiberius Claudius Nero, with whom she had grown up. Now, the two pawns would masquerade as spouses. Tiberius, for his part, had been required to divorce Vipsania Agrippina, Julia's former stepdaughter, and the woman he loved also that he could fulfill Augustus's barely concealed dynastic schemes. And yet, in spite of their disdain for one another, the pair still managed to unite the Julian and Claudian bloodlines by producing a son. But, whatever fragile bond may have formed between Julia and Tiberius after the birth of their son was immediately shattered when the frail little boy failed to thrive, eventually dying in infancy, the emotional hell that was the life of Julia's husband, Tiberius, could not conceivably grow worse, but it did. Tiberius's brother, Drusus, died suddenly, and suspiciously, from an infected leg wound received while on campaign in Germania. And by the time the body of Drusus was cremated, and placed within the mausoleum of Augustus, Julia's marriage to Tiberius was no marriage at all just a legally binding arrangement that suited Julia well. During her marriage to Marcellus, a union thought to epitomize the future of Rome, Julia had become the central socialite of a new brand of society clique. Comprised of the young adults who belonged to Rome's new and powerful post-Civil War families, this first generation of peacetime children attended the most elegant soirees, philosophical lectures, public pantomimes, 
and readings of poetry by upcoming authors hoping to gain their financial patronage. It was at one such function, probably while holding court as musicians played their tibias, cymbals and drums, accompanied by the libretto of singers, and while guests lounged on dining sofas, washing down culinary delicacies with expensive Falernian wine, that Julia met the young scion of a great, but long-forgotten house. He went simply by Sempronius Gracchus, the best way to advertise his most famous ancestors, the brothers Gracchi. Sempronius was a relative of Julia's half-brother, Publius Cornelius Scipio Mosellinus, whose Cornelian ancestors had intermarried with the Sempronii Gracchi for generations. Exactly when the affair between Julia, the life of the party, and the dashing Sempronius Gracchus began, is uncertain. However, by the time she was married to Marcus Agrippa, Julia's many pregnancies functioned as a convenient cover for her promiscuity. When those in her clique marveled that all her children looked like Agrippa, Julia was heard to joke that it was because she only took on passengers when the hull was already full. After the death of her infant son, and during Tiberius's reassignment to Germania, where Caesar Augustus used her husband to replace the fallen Drusus, Julia drowned her sorrows in a dizzying social life. Her return to the social clique, along with her overindulgence in wine, music and good times, became the stuff of dinnertime humour for her nonchalant father, Augustus, who reproved the behaviour of his spoiled daughter with a dismissive shrug, saying only, I have two wayward daughters, Julia, and Rome, but for Julia, illegally forced into a third marriage, even as her newly widowed cousin Antonella easily acquired legal sui juris, the deeper meaning of her father's comparison between herself and Rome was becoming crystal clear. Julia was the doorway to Rome's destiny. The heirs of the empire were her own sons, Gaius and Lucius, had she thus far failed to recognize her own power to decide Rome's future? After all, Julia needed but to open her eyes to see that she was not only mother of the heirs bearing the name Caesar, but that as the widow of Marcus Agrippa, she was also the mother of Posthumus, the sole son who could carry on Agrippa's name. Julia held an enviable position whereby she could expect the dual devotion of the legions of Rome, but Julia must be discreet as she puzzled over how to quietly build a political party around her sons. Had she forgotten there were two sides to her mother's family? Before marrying the young Caesar D.V. Filius, Julia's mother, Scribonia, herself a member of the patrician Cornelii, had been married to Nias Cornelius Lentulus, a grandson of Scipio Narsica. Her mother's former husband was descended from the same combined Cornelii Scipionis and Sempronii Gracchi family tree from which Sempronius Gracchus had sprung. By extension, Julia's half-brother, Mosellinus, and her half-sister, Cornelia Scipio, were also descendants of this long-standing family alliance which had dominated Roman politics during the era of the Punic Wars and the husband of her half-sister was the brother of the former triumvir, Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, yet another patrician family which had been sidelined under the regime of Julia's father. By uniting the Cornelii and Sempronii clans behind her three sons, Julia just might succeed in dragging her mother's family back to the top of Rome's hierarchy, displacing the Claudians, and displacing her husband as well. But. Who would replace Tiberius? Julia needed a man, one around whom all her supporters might rally. Sempronius Gracchus might be a fun bit of distraction for Julia, but he was just a party boy. However, Julia did know of one other descendant of the Sempronii Gracchi clan who might be more serious-minded, and he was a man who might rally around her sons. Yes. This man was potentially an untapped source of political leverage. He was Eulus, the last surviving son of Marcus Antonius, the greatest enemy of Julia's father, Caesar, Augustus, 